much. My name is Matt Britton, and I'm lucky enough to be the director of this uh, fine ensemble. There are actually four different steel drum bands at Vanderbilt University. Uh, we've got a beginning, intermediate, and this is the advanced group. I've also got a steel band made up of all football players from the team. So. It's a lot of fun. I get to spend my time teaching this kind of music. Today, we're going to try to take you down to the island of Trinidad, let you uh, visit the Caribbean for an hour, and, uh, and experience a little bit about the music. It's an instrument that you hear a lot on TV, video games, commercials, but rarely do you, you get to hear them live and actually see how they work. So we're going to take you on a little bit of a, a history trip, talk about how these instruments evolved, talk about how they're made, show you a little bit about how they work, and, and talk about it in between playing songs. We're also going to open it up a couple different times for questions. So if this is your first time seeing this instrument and you've got a question, feel free to uh, put down your chips and raise your hand and I'll try to, try to address that to you. But anyway, thank you guys for being here. Uh, the first tune we did was a real popular tune. If you've ever been on a cruise ship, you may have heard that tune. It's called Dala, and uh, real popular in the Caribbean. Uh, the next thing we'd like to do is, like I said, kind of take you on how the instrument came about. So, um, so many things uh, came out of the African uh, when, when slavery began and they, the, the people were brought from West Africa to the Caribbean to work the sugarcane plantations, coffee, uh, cocoa plantations. Uh, they could not bring their, their indigenous instruments. And drumming was banned. So they weren't allowed to play anything wooden with a skin on the top of it. So in Trinidad, uh, they discovered the crop of bamboo grew all over the island. And they could go in the forest and cut down bamboo, let it dry, and create music using bamboo. The uh, plantation owners didn't have a problem with that. Um, and so that was kind of the first music throughout slavery in Trinidad. And we're going to demonstrate a little bit, if I could get a, a help from from Ali up here and a couple folks in back. We don't have any bamboo here. The National Zoo's got some, but uh, they wouldn't let us have it. So we're gonna use these lovely PVC pipes, but it acts just like bamboo. Bamboo is hollow in the middle, and uh, if you stamp it on the ground, it makes a pitch. The lower, the longer the tube, the lower the pitch, shorter the tube, the higher the pitch. And they called this tambu bamboo. And like I said, it was their form of music for a number of years uh, through slavery and beyond. So here's kind of what Tambu Bamboo sounded like. So that was all that they had at that time. Uh, and these Tambu Bamboo bands continued even after slavery, primarily in the, uh, the, the, the Port of Spain area, which is the, the capital of Trinidad. And most of these bands at carnival time would come out on the street, mostly young men, and that was their instrument. And they would parade through the streets at carnival. Trouble is, these were young men and quite often from really bad parts of town and they would come across rival bands, and there would actually be conflict in the streets at carnival time. And so these pieces of bamboo that are instruments one minute became weapons the next. Uh, they would actually sharpen the ends of some of the bamboo and, and use them, and there was, there was bloodshed sometimes at carnival when these bands from different areas would come together. So the, the police, the government came in, and took away the Tambu Bamboo. Um, it still existed kind of behind the scenes, and at carnival time, they also needed something a bit louder. They found that the bamboo didn't go, go too loud, so they started experimenting with things that the police couldn't take away. Pots and pans, biscuit tins, uh, tops of trash cans, whatever they could find metallic, it would be louder than Tambu Bamboo that the police couldn't take away. They can't take away your your pot and your pan and your trash can, all right? If so, you just go get another one. And so from Tambu Bamboo, they started experimenting with pots and pans, pieces of steel, whatever they could find. You'll hear in the back, um, 
Ali's going to be playing a break drum off a car. Really traditional uh, instrument in Trinidad, because again, it was a found sound. Anybody seen the percussion group Stomp or Blue Men Group? Yeah, they take ordinary sounds, create percussion music with them. Same thing was going on in Trinidad for years. So you're going to hear a break drum, maybe a rum bottle, a cowbell, and I'm going to be banging on a pot up here. This is what music in Trinidad sounded like after Tambu Band. So a bit louder, yeah, give it up for our great drummer, John Mayer. So quite a bit louder, made more sounds, and, and they were able to go through the streets with that. Now, a lot of people collectively developed the steel pan, but there are a couple names that are important in the actual development. A young guy, he was only about 13 or 14 at the time, named Winston Spree Simon, had taken his mom's pot off the stove, banged on it for three days during carnival, and after three days of banging on it, he noticed there were a series of dents that he had put on this, on this pan. He thought before he brings that back to mom, he better try to fix that, or he's going to get in trouble. So he took a hammer and tried to, tried to hammer out those dents. And he noticed the big dents made kind of a low sound, the small dents made a higher sound. And that was kind of the beginning of the development of the steel pan. Um, for years, they started just putting bigger and smaller dents on things like this until in about 1942, 1943, a young man by the name of Ellie Manette. Again, what's so cool about this story is he was only 13, 14 years old from a really rough part of town. Ellie Manette took a 55-gallon oil barrel and used that same philosophy of a big dent being a low note, small dent being a high note and created the first actual steel drum on a 55-gallon barrel. Back then, they used to go through the streets with them hanging around their neck, and that was called Pan Around the Neck. And I'm going to show you a little bit. I, I had this steel drum, and Ellie actually helped me tune this to where it sounded like it did back in the 40s. So I'm going to take a second and put this steel drum on, let you hear what old-time steel pans sound. Percussive sound. But you can definitely hear a pitch there, the low pitches and the high pitches. And the early steel band sounded like that. A few years, years later, a guy didn't like the sound of the really harsh wood against the metal. So he took a bicycle inner tube and wrapped it around the stick. And all of a sudden it went from this real percussive sound to kind of mellow. rubber tip, tip sticks today to mellow the sound. So the whole history goes from tambu bamboo to pots and pans to actual 55 gallon oil barrels. And that's what you see up here. Everything up here, even these chrome plated ones, are all made out of 55 gallon oil barrels, all hand hammered. There's a, a series of hammers you use when you make these. You start by sinking the barrel into the bowl. And then in a second here, you'll see the inside. They groove out the notes with big dents and small dents, low pitches and high pitches, 
and then they tune with a hammer all of the different notes you hear in the band. Um, and what we're going to do right now is kind of show you the different parts of the steel band. The folks that play the melody are on these chrome pans up front. They're called, in Trinidad, they call them tenor pans. Um, but here we just call them lead pans because they're playing the lead voice. Kind of like the soprano in a choir. If you guys could kind of, one or two of you, tip those up. You can see the notes around the outside, the indentations are fairly large. On the inside, they're fairly small. Each drum has about two and a half octaves of notes, and primarily they're the lead singers, the, the melody players of the band. And again, these are the lead pans. Only one barrel makes up that instrument with the two and a half octaves in. The voice here, these are called double tenors. The dents are getting bigger, so you need more barrels. So Ali has two barrels there. The double tenors act a lot like the lead playing a melody, only an octave lower to help, help uh, beef up the sound. The next voice down, these are called double seconds. Again, the dents are getting even bigger. Uh, and the job for these guys is to play like the right hand of a piano, uh, the upper part of a chord, all right? Uh, back here, yeah, these are a little harder to get up in the air. Yeah, Trevor, cool. These work in a set of three. These are called triple guitars or cellos. Different, different uh, tuners call them different things. But you need three barrels to make up a set. And they're more like the left hand of the piano. They're doing more lower harmony. And we, again, those work in sets of three. And then finally, we have Sarah on the bass. We have six full-size 55-gallon barrels. None of the skirts caught up, uh, cut off. They're just full-size barrels like you'd see out in the park, and then each barrel, Sarah, can you pick one of those up over your head? No. Uh, each barrel has three notes in it, so you have to have six barrels to make up an entire set to play tunes. You have to kind of, you'll see that she has to move around between those six barrels and, uh, in order to play her part. So this next tune we're going to do, we're going to play this song, it's called Jume Man by a Calypso singer from Trinidad named David Rudder, and we're going to play through the song. And then we're going to let each section play their part by themselves. Basses will go first, we'll let you hear them. Guitars will go second, double seconds third, then the melody fourth. And then we'll end by playing the tune all together. This will give you a chance to hear each individual section of the band. Then we'll open it up and see at that point if you guys have any questions. So here's Juve Man featuring each part of the band.
All right, and as a, a little added bonus for those of you that, that couldn't see real well when they were tipping the pans up, I'm going to have three of the gals with lead pans out in the lobby afterwards. So if you actually want to see up close and personal what these things look like, feel free to see one of them out front right after the show, and we'll, uh, they'll, they'll give you a little 50-cent tour. Yeah, I'd like to address any questions about any of the history or construction before we get into a little more of the music. Yes, sir? Good question. This question was, in case you couldn't hear in back, what's the sheet music look like that they're reading? Um, it's just traditional, uh, it, you, we, we read regular music. Uh, you don't have to transpose, like saxophone players have to transpose to different keys. We can play in any key, all right? It's just like a piano. We've got all the, all the black and white notes of a piano. So it's just traditional music. We could take any chart within reason and, and, and play it. So yeah, really good question. Now they all, you know, leads are playing in treble clef, treble clef with a little bass clef mixed in. The whole back half of the band primarily plays in bass clef. But uh, yeah, regular, regular old music. In Trinidad, they, not a lot of folks, the music education aspect of reading music hasn't caught up with the steel band down there, but they learn so fast by ear. It's amazing. They'll learn these huge, complicated phrases all by ear and repetition. So their ears are better than ours. We sight read and, and read music better than them. It's a trade off. We work on trying to get better with our ears. They're working real hard down there through music education in Trinidad to get the, the kids primarily to read better where they get up in the big steel bands they can, they can, they can uh, read the music. Yes, sir. Good question. We, he asked, you know, how, how many does it take to, to play in a band? Um, you can have one on a part, as long as you have melody, upper harmony, lower harmony, and bass. We could do a song with just four people and a drummer. Um, this is just how many instruments we own uh, at, at Vanderbilt. Uh, so this is the, you know, the, the classes that I teach all have a class cap to where we, we fit the band. Um, the band sizes in Trinidad, check this out, we're, what, 13 strong here, something like that. The bands in Trinidad, the big bands, have 120 players. Yeah, it's a huge sound. If you've, if you've never experienced that, it's, it's just like standing in front of the Rolling Stones loud. It's really loud and really exciting. It'll, it'll just get the, get the hair on your arms to stand up when you hear it for the first time. Uh, if you ever get as far south as Trinidad, Ask a cab driver to take you to one of the pan yards, especially during carnival time, and you'll hear these big bands. You can see them on YouTube, but it's just like anything else. Hearing it out of your computer speakers versus standing in front of it is uh, is, is a different different ball game. Yeah, another question. I don't know. The, you mean the skirt? Yeah, so like, like Sarah's, you couldn't put a lead pan on that long skirt. The, the length of the skirt, and the skirt I'm referring to is this part here. The shorter the skirt, it helps project the, especially the high notes out. So the, the higher drums have shorter skirts. The lower drums, those lower skirts help the, help the low notes project. So yeah, the, did that kind of answer it? Okay, yeah, right behind you. Rhea, are you on scholarship? Rhea. Rhea's actually from born and born, and when, when did you move to the States? You were about how old? Okay. Yeah, she was born there, uh, has, still has lots of family back in Trinidad, um, and moved here to the States when she was about seven. Um, I have had some students. There's another student in my intermediate band who was born and raised. I've had, I've had kids that were, maybe grew up in Brooklyn, but their grandparents are from Trinidad. So there is, a, there is a small Caribbean contingency both at Vanderbilt and here in Nashville. Uh, so yeah, Rhea is a, a perfect example of a, a Trinidadian who has, uh, has joined our band. So yeah, right here. Good question. Do you have to be a drummer or a percussionist to do this? No, there, there are um, 
There are certain aspects of being able to move your hands with speed and control that help, but how many percussionists do we have? One, two, out of this whole band, only three are actual percussionists and percussion majors at Blair. Uh, the rest are all, we got engineering students, we got non-music majors, we got music minors. The class is open to anybody, um, and there's certain advantages. Sometimes non-drummers have better ears and can, can apply strengths that maybe a drummer wouldn't have. So I'll accept anybody, and, and uh, some schools, it's just, like universities, it's just reserved for the percussion department. University of Kentucky, perfect example. They don't let anybody in unless you're a, a percussion major. We, we treat it a little bit differently. But we... Yeah. Pretty much everybody up here plays an instrument, like my beginning band, you don't have to read music at all. We write the notes in underneath, and I, you couldn't tell probably from there, but each one of these pans has a little sticker with the notes. This is my advanced band, they're probably not looking down at the stickers much, but my beginning band, they see B flat, C, D on their music written in, and they find those corresponding notes on their pans. And there's a lot of muscle memory, you can just get used to where all the notes are. So, yeah. What's the cost? You're looking at $20,000 right here. Uh, that covers all the barrels, the stands. Um, it's, it's a pretty expensive thing. Obviously, oil barrels don't cost that much. It's all the artistic labor that goes to get a trash can to sound like that. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of work goes into getting the notes tuned just right to where they sound like that. And there is a maintenance each year, each spring, we have a steel pan tuner come through and tune the entire band just through general playing. They'll go slightly out of tune, and he comes in with a stroke tuner just like a piano tuner would, and he, with his hammers, they'll fix the notes to where they're back in tune again. So yeah, there is a little bit of an upkeep, but yeah, this is about $20,000 here. All right, we've got one more question. Okay, they're just waving, cool. One more question all the way in the back, then we're gonna play a little bit more for you, and then I'll open up for some questions at the end. I just don't wanna run out of time. Yes, sir. Most steel bands now do use drum set. We have done songs to where we don't have any percussion at all. To where it's just, uh, it, classical music is real big in Trinidad on steel pans. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, they felt to legitimize the instrument, they had to move away from playing Yellow Bird and Jamaican Farewell, and they started playing really heavy classical music. So you can hear Bach and Beethoven and Stravinsky, and there's no drum set with that. But for calypso tunes, Soka tunes, reggae tunes, which we're going to do next. The drum set really works as kind of the catalyst to hold everybody together. Um, so the next tune we're going to do, Bob Marley used no steel drums. Steel drums didn't come from Jamaica, but most steel bands end up playing a reggae song every now and then. It just works really well. He wrote such beautiful music that we thought we'd go ahead and do a reggae tune for you here. This is called Jammin'. Thank you. 
different types of music that this instrument can play. Uh, we play Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. We play folk songs from Taiwan. We've done a little of everything. Uh, I like to try to do things a little out of the box so people go, oh, okay, steel drums can do something other than play Margarita. And this next tune is a perfect example. We had a student a couple years ago named Brad Ralston who was uh, pre-med and a composition major at the same time. So uh, figure that. And he wrote this tune while he was, I think, a junior at Vanderbilt. It's called Sundown Groove, and it doesn't sound like any other steel band music I've ever heard. Um, it doesn't have a calypso groove. Uh, it doesn't really sound islandy. It's more of a, almost like if I had to categorize it, it's almost like a jazz piece. So this is a, just kind of a little showcase of how you can go outside of the Caribbean and, and, and do different things on the steel band. It's called Sundown Groove.
Right, we've got a couple more tunes for you, but uh, are there any other questions at this point? Yeah, right here. Where do you get your drums from? Like, I'm familiar with Pan Yard in Ohio, but not yeah. anywhere here. Um, she asked, where do we get our, our steel pans from? Um, actually, there's a company called Manette Steel Drums, uh, and Ellie Manette, the, the guy that I mentioned earlier, that was the first to put uh, dents on a 55-gallon barrel. Ellie is in his 80s, but still alive and living in West Virginia. Um, he moved to the States back in the, in the, uh, the mid-70s, and he's at, uh, kind of ensconced at the, West, at the University of West Virginia right now. He's got a whole workshop there, and he's got a younger generation. For example, the guy that's going to come tune our steel pans uh, in the spring studied with Ellie as an apprentice, so when Ellie dies, all the secrets of his hammers and the way he tunes uh, you know, won't go with him. He's got all these, these, these young people that are studying with him. So uh, the Minette, Ellie Minette's the one who, who had a hand in, in making these instruments. Uh, I think one of the pans, actually they aren't here, but Ali's got a steel pan that she got from Trinidad, a company called uh, Panland. Um, my drum that I was playing was tuned by Ellie, but made by a different guy named Patrick Arnold, who lives in San, San Francisco. So there's yet to be a way to mass produce these things, stamping them out with a hydro press, they've tried that. Nothing sounds like taking a hammer and sinking it down into that bowl shape and, and figuring the notes inside. Anybody, any engineers come up with a way to, uh, to, to fashion these things and stamp them out uh, to where they can be mass produced and they'd make a whole lot of money. But at this point, nobody's figured out quite how to do that yet. The, uh, the hydro sunk ones, where they, uh, they, they spin it down and, and tune it after that, just sound awful. Uh, quite honestly, they don't sound anything like these. There is tons of experimentation going on, both in Trinidad and here in the States, try, trying to improve on basically what's a trash can uh, and all the, all the you know, metallurgical things that go in uh, in, in these barrels. So, um, so yeah, but our, our pans basically came from West Virginia through a guy from Trinidad. So, yeah, any other questions? We got some Florida. I, I think it's great because I've never heard of this band in Vanderbilt or anywhere else. I thought it was just something that was in the islands and in the states. I think it's great that you guys are doing this, and I want to thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. You know that the instrument from when it started in the '40s. In the, in the mid-'70s, when it started coming to universities uh, in, in the United States, and since then, boy, you, you, there's steel bands all over. I know that, that, that you heard them down in South Florida and you weren't aware of the Vanderbilt Band, but if you just think of the Southeast Conference schools, University of Georgia has a steel band, University of Florida has a steel band, Old Miss has a steel band, Tennessee used to. Um, the, the bands are old and I think in a basement somewhere right now. Uh, who else? Kentucky has a steel band, I mean, there are five right off the top of my head that are all in the SEC. It's just such a great teaching tool because you're teaching rhythm, fairly complicated syncopations, uh, you're teaching melody and harmony, and learning how to play together as an ensemble. There are actually some school districts that have gotten rid of traditional band and choir, and their main focus is steel band. I'm not suggesting that, but there are, that's how popular it is getting. And literally, from Fairbanks, Alaska to Zimbabwe, that's what I use as kind of a, uh, a, an example. There's steel band activity in Fairbanks, Alaska, and it's also gotten all the way back to actually where the rhythm started in, in Africa. So it's everywhere. Um, the Swiss, there, there's a huge steel band presence in Switzerland, Paris, all over the place. So the instrument is truly expanding out there through music education. And it's, uh, it's hard to be in a bad mood when you're either teaching or playing this thing. So thank you for your, for your compliments. Appreciate it. Yeah, I think we're going to get into another tune, and we'll, we'll, we'll save one, one more little tiny segment for any questions at the end. Um, one of the great Calypso singers uh, in Trinidad passed away a few years ago. It was Lord Kitchener, um, and this is a tune that he wrote called Sugar Bobo. Thank you. 
concert real quick, a little, uh, little soft motion, April 21st, which is a Sunday night uh, at the Blair School of Music on the campus of Vanderbilt. Um, we do our concert at 7 o'clock, and it's free. There's free parking right across the street in the new garage they built. We'd love to see any and all of you there. Again, April 21st, Sunday night, 7 o'clock. Um, the gals will have some of my business cards from Vanderbilt out front. If you want to stay in touch with the band, if you want to get on our, e on our emailing list, be glad to, to let you know each semester uh, when our concerts are. If we're doing anything like this out in the community, we'd email you and let you know. We've also got a Facebook page. Look us up there if you want to, to, to see little uh, pictures and stuff from our concerts and, and keep, keep in touch with us there. Also, finally, this class is open to anyone. All right, You don't have to be a Vanderbilt student. I've had adults take this class. Uh, I've had pre-college, I've had high school seniors take this class. Um, and let me tell you a secret, it's actually cheaper signing up as an adult than it is as a student. <laughs> it's just part of their continuing education. They try to, they try to outreach and, and get adults to, to sign up for different classes there. Uh, so if you're interested in being in the Vanderbilt Steel Band, um, and we've been this close to having entire adult steel bands with no students before, just have to have a certain number of enrollment to make it work. If you're interested, again, grab a business card, shoot me an email. I uh, would love to teach you how to do this. And it's fairly easy to get started, all right? The notes are right on there. You don't have to know how to read music. You just match the notes up with what's on there. So don't be intimidated. And it's just a heck of a lot of fun. I uh, would like to also thank uh, Vanderbilt and the TPAC folks for having us out here and giving us lunch and just 
just being great hosts. So thank you guys. We got one more real short tune before we begin. Yet. Any last minute questions before we play our last tune? Yes, back here. Question was teach by ear, teach by music, which is easier. For some people, they, they like just watching and listening and, and watching and, and, and doing what you're you know, repeating what you're doing. Other people have to see it on paper. It really depends. Um, generally, you know, folks that are that are used to reading music, they started in third or fourth grade band, and they were taught to read the page. Sometimes it's a stretch for them for me to say, okay, I'm going to teach you this next eight bars by rote, and I'm just going to show you, here's a, here's a change. I have, to, I have to see it on paper. Other people are like, they prefer just to have me show it to them. So it really depends on, on the personality and, and the way that person learns. So yeah, any other questions? Yeah, there are some elementary school bands throughout the country. I don't know of any in Nashville, uh, but there are. I've, I worked with a band in Des Moines, Iowa, um, that started the kids in third grade, and to play the bass pans, they had to have little boxes that they stood on <laughs> so they could get up and, and, and be on top of the drums to hit the notes. Yeah, it's not as popular there. It's more popular in high school. There are middle school steel bands. Sarah, where's Sarah? How old were you when you started in Cincinnati? 12. She was 12 when she started. Um, and who, who else played in high school? Ah, and where? Okay. Um, Becca played in Key West, Florida in elementary school, a steel band there. So perfect example, I had forgotten about that. But more popular in high school and definitely in college. So cool, yeah, one more question right back there. I uh, asked if there was specific types of steel. They used to just grab whatever barrels they could find. Now the, 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 the pan makers, and a regular traditional oil barrel has got a hole in one end for you to pour whatever's inside of the oil or, or whatever liquid is inside out. Now these guys that make these things order barrels specifically without the holes so they can use both sides. Uh, and don't have to like, they can make two lead pans out of one barrel because there's no hole in one end. Uh, they used to have Department of Transportation stamps that were in there, not, not just ink, but they were actually embossed in the metal if you find an old oil drum. And when you try to tune those, they would often split. So they order the barrels without any stamps on them. And they have gotten into, I don't know the whole science behind it, but they are now, you know, they, they can determine how much sink, uh, a zinc and or whatever else goes into the, to the type of steel. They, they've done a lot of science with exactly what the metallurgy is to make the best barrel to tune these things with. So it's not just like it was you know, 40 years ago, go out and find a barrel like that one and, uh, and, and make, a, make a pan. It's quite a bit more, more scientific than that at this point. All right, we're gonna play one more tune for you. If you think of any other questions, I'll be available. The gals will be available up front. Thank you guys so much for coming out and spending your lunch time with us. And thank you for doing this.